This week, I got a month of news to get caught up on. So let's get right to it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending October 25th, 2021. First and foremost in the news this week is the codification of the USPS Vape Mail Ban. Published October 21st, 2021, the Postal Service has issued its final rule about the statutory framework for ENDS products. As a consequence of Public Law 116-160, otherwise known as the Preventing Online Sales of E-Cigarettes to Children Act, and the Previous Standing Pact Act, otherwise known as the Prevent All Cigarette Trafficking Act of 2009, the mailing of any and all vape products is banned, blocked, and classified as non-mailable cigarettes slash smokeless tobacco, thanks to the catch-all terminology imposed by your congresspersons. It has nothing to do with Trump signing it into law or Biden being the current president. In the United States of America, your state elected senators and your district elected representatives are the ones who write and pass all the laws that we have to follow and deal with. And for those of you who don't believe me till you see it personally, let me show you the final summary. ENDS products are generally non-mailable, except as authorized by an exception. And then, only if all PACT Act related and non-PACT Act related conditions of mailability are met. This means no store can legally sell and mail you any ENDS related product. This also includes any and all cannabis vape products. Don't believe me? Here's an article for you. If an online vape shop wants to sell any electronic device that aerosolizes a solution or allows you to inhale from the device or any component, liquid, part, or accessory of an ENDS product, they must use a private carrier to deliver the products to you. Now... There are a few exceptions to this final vape mail ban rule. If you're a business and you're sending items to another business, well, you can register yours in the recipient's tobacco licenses, your ATF registration details, and each and every relative's DNA sequence with the post office, you know, their pre-existing centralized application system for business regulatory purposes of your packages. I'll even give you the form number here in a little bit. Or, if you live in Alaska or Hawaii, and the package is not leaving the state, well, then you can mail an ENDS product to anybody you want. But, for the other 40 states, the only exception to legally send vape gear in the mail is registered business to registered business. Think this prohibition is completely ridiculous? Let me tell you about how it gets worse. Consumer testing and public health exceptions Apply for cigarettes, but not to end products. This means that if a health agency got reports of a tainted batch of e-liquid and wanted to send it through the mail to a non-registered testing facility, they can't use the postal system. It's got to use a private courier. The only exception to this process is for regulatory purposes. You know, between the state and the federal agency, in a business that's seeking to meet the regulatory requirements. And if that wasn't bad enough, since the U.S. Postal Service cannot fulfill the PACT Act's verification requirements, all inbound or outbound international mail containing cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, and ends is non-mailable, without exception. This also includes U.S. military postal addresses. This whole thing is just another bureaucratic red tape spider web for lawyers to hash out. Compliments of Congress and your failure to vote these schmucks representing you out of office. Anything vape related is banned. If they find it, you forfeit the seized items and they're going to be destroying it. 
If you're a business sending items via the business slash regulatory purposes exception, you must complete United States Postal Service Form 4615 and get approval before your items are going to be entered into the postal system. Moving on. Moving on to Gloucestershire in southwest England, where the Trading Standards Service confiscated 1,500 disposable e-cigarettes being sold illegally, sold under brands such as Puff Bar, Elf Bar, and Geek Bar. The confiscated vapes didn't show the required labeling and or safety information, or warn to keep away from children. They also failed to display the details of the nicotine content and the strength per dose, or any traceability information such as batch codes or importer details. Sarah Scott, Executive Director of Adult Social Care and Public Health said, in recent years, nicotine vaping products have become the most popular aid used by smokers trying to quit, and they are far less harmful than cigarettes. Whilst they can be a really useful tool to tackle tobacco addiction, it is imperative that users have access to quality products that have been approved by the MHRA to ensure consumer safety. So even in England, where the products are tested for safety and uses growing for these products, no surprise bad actors are going to ignore the law and sell what the consumers want. Might have something to do with the fact higher nicotine vapes are needed by some smokers to quit their habit. And yes, this has been scientifically proven and already covered right here on this channel. So let's move on to Hong Kong where lawmakers pass a bill banning import, sale, and manufacture of electronic cigarettes and heated tobacco products. The ban will go into effect mid-2022 and the maximum penalty for offenders will be $50,000 Hong Kong and six months in prison. The law targets only vape shops and the local businesses of vaping. Consumers will still be able to use the devices they already have, but any new consumers must find their products on the black market. What makes this news even more disastrous is most of the vapes that we have in the United States, or if you go to order them from China, they pass through Hong Kong, or they were straight outright shipped from a warehouse in Hong Kong. Once this law goes into full effect, the pathway for products is going to need to shift to some other country, like maybe Russia. Well, that's just going to make getting these products from Shenzhen that much more expensive. Moving on to Singapore, where a crackdown on vaping just busted $2 million worth of products. On 11 October 2021, the Health Science Authority conducted an operation and seized a total of $2,260,825 worth of e-vaporizers and related components. A total of 10,057 assorted vapes, 48,822 pods, and 187 e-liquids were seized by the health authority. This is the largest seizure of tobacco products in the country to date. Moving on to Lansing, Michigan, where the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services this week abruptly pulled back rules that would have banned the sale of flavored nicotine products in Michigan. This move prompted cancellation of a Thursday legislative meeting where Republican lawmakers were expected to question the advance of these proposed rules. The six-page bill has been worked on for over two years and was expected to impose an 18% tax on liquid nicotine solution, which would have raised between seven and $10 million in new tax revenue per year. So what happens next? Who knows? But it's something to keep an eye on because you know these legislators, they're famous for getting us to take our eye off the ball just before they silently pass something and even worse. Just like in Bangor, Maine, where city leaders are considering a flavored tobacco ban. Jeff Leadbetter, president of the Leadbetter Super Stops, wrote this letter to the Bangor Daily News, expressing his disapproval of the proposed ban. He states he has been operating convenience stores in Bangor for 26 years, growing to eight stores 
and now employs 85 people. Tobacco products represent 40% of their business, and more than 40 local businesses would be completely decimated if the city banned flavored tobacco products. What the hell is going on here? Don't these people know that this is supposed to be Stoptober? The most successful quit smoking campaign on the planet, hands down. Seriously, folks, just check out the UK's National Health Service website. Giving up smoking is one of the best things you'll ever do for your health. There are lots of other benefits, too, and they start almost immediately. They even have a free NHS quit smoking app to track your progress. See how much you're saving and get daily support. If you can make it 28 days smoke-free, you are five times more likely to have quit for good. And they even have a Facebook group that you can join to get help from others trying to quit the same time you are. And if that's not enough, you can even go to the vape clinic launched by UK's largest vaping retailer, VPZ. Smokers can get dedicated one-to-one -one consultation with a vape specialist to make sure your first setup works to stop smoking. You know, we talked about this before. They even have a money back guarantee if the vape that they sell you doesn't get you to stop smoking. It really is that effective. Find the right device filled with the right flavor and anyone can easily stop smoking. VPZ has already helped 700,000 smokers in Britain to quit smoking. The evidence on the effectiveness of e-cigarettes is incontrovertible. Hence, our next story from Bangladesh. Voices of Vapor organized a webinar where speakers presented findings of a recently released white paper containing case studies on vaping in four countries. Here's just some of the highlights of the webinar. Michael Landell, director of the World Vapors Alliance, said, progressive countries are implementing vaping regulations. If Bangladesh implements the regulation for vaping, it could be six million people who could switch to vaping rather than smoking deadly combustible cigarettes. Vapes are at least 95% safer than the traditional combustible tobacco. According to Public Health England, it's not the nicotine that kills people. It's the tar from smoking. Vapes are five to seven times more effective to quit tobacco than any other nicotine replacement therapy, like patches or nicotine gums. Countries that embrace vaping, such as France and the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and Canada, have witnessed a decrease in smoking rates that is twice as fast as the global average. So it's no wonder the Canadian Vaping Association encourages smokers to join the community quitting challenge known as Stoptober. They even issued a press release to encourage smokers to join this Stoptober campaign. Care to guess how many news agencies around the whole world bothered to pick up this press release? Four websites republished the press release, and none of them are actually news websites. TechieLive.in, UserWalls.com, ZoomInfo.com, and NewsNow.co.uk. That's it. Care to guess what actually made the news? Los Angeles Times reported, California will impose new vaping tax to curb teen use. Fund public health programs. Here we go. Amid concern over widespread teen vaping, Governor Gavin Newsom on Monday approved a new 12.5% excise tax on electronic cigarettes to be paid by California consumers to boost public health and education programs. The new vaping tax is supported by health groups, including the American Cancer Society, American Lung Association, and the California Medical Association. Why would the American Cancer Society, the American Lung Association, and the California Medical Association support a tax that has been scientifically proven to increase smoking rates? If you can answer that question, please leave a comment below. The new tax is projected to generate $38.4 million by 2023, with money to be split 
among several programs, including early childhood education, public health education, and grants to students from disadvantaged communities pursuing an education in the health field. Meanwhile, Matthew Perrone of the Associated Press reports, is teen vaping fizzling out? New report finds big drop in youth's use of e-cigarettes during COVID. Teen vaping plummeted this year as many U.S. students were forced to learn from home during the pandemic, according to a government report released Thursday. U.S. health officials urge caution in interpreting these numbers. But Dr. Nancy Rigotti of Harvard University, who was not involved in this research, says they found a dramatic drop from last year. And it's hard to imagine that doesn't represent a real decrease in use among high school and middle school students. In a national survey, 11% of high school students and less than 3% of middle school students said that they were recent past 30 day users of e-cigarettes and other vaping products, according to the Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Disease Control. That's roughly 40% drop from last year with nearly 20% of high school students and 5% of middle schoolers saying that they recently vaped. If this year's numbers hold up, it would be the second big drop in a row from a peak of 28% for high schoolers in 2019. That's almost a 61% drop in two years. But despite the two-year consecutive drop, CDC specialist Dr. Karen Hacker said, E-cigarette use among youth remains a serious public health concern. Well, that statement just begs for some science to completely disprove the CDC specialist. Published in JAMA Network, we find trends in nicotine product use among U.S. adolescents, 1999 to 2020. Key points. Question. How has exposure to nicotine products and their associated risk among U.S. adolescents changed owing to the popularity of e-cigarettes? Findings. The cross-sectional study, which included 16 years of survey data between 15,000 and 36,000 students in grades 6 through 12 per year, found that exposure to nicotine products as assessed by nicotine product days decreased prior to the popularity of e-cigarettes, and this decreased slowed and then reversed going to the upsurge of vaping. However, adjusting for differential long-term risk of nicotine products, risk-adjusted nicotine product days may have decreased if the risk associated with vaping is sufficiently low compared to that of smoking. Meaning, this study suggests that whether the health risk associated with nicotine product use among U.S. adolescents have increased owing to the popularity of e-cigarettes depends solely on the assessment of the risks associated with vaping. Conclusion and relevance. This study suggests that NPDs represent an improvement, albeit an imperfect one, compared with a 30-day tobacco product use by incorporating the frequency of use of various products. By distinguishing products, NPDs permit consideration of the health consequences associated with different mixes of products over time. Health risks of adolescent nicotine use could have been decreased during the vaping popularity if assessment of long-term risk associated with vaping compared with the smoking is low. In other words, you should be grateful that these teens are experimenting with vaping products and not deadly combustible tobacco. Mark my words, people. If cities and states just keep on banning the safer alternative product, they're going to have no choice but to go back to lighting tobacco on fire and then dying from it. Science has already proven e-cigarette use is substantially less hazardous to health than cigarette smoking. And for that reason alone, vaping and smoking cannot be treated the same. Not in research studies and certainly not in regulations and laws that are supposed to protect the public health. This study aimed to evaluate nicotine product days to determine actual nicotine use, and even admitted that some of these kids have been using THC products and not nicotine. It also admitted that a volley was caused by vaping THC adulterated with vitamin E acetate, and it had nothing to do with nicotine vaping. Regardless, the cross-sectional study shows substantial decreases in adolescent nicotine and tobacco product use. While there was a spike of e-cigarette use, when factoring in the risk weight of these products, nicotine product days continued to decline throughout the entire 20 years studied. Nicotine product days continued to decline throughout the entire 20 years studied. Nicotine product days continued to decline throughout the entire 20 years studied. I'm sorry, CDC specialist, Dr. Karen Hacker, but this study proves that you are nothing but a quack. Moving on to the FDA, who finally authorizes the first e-cigarette and says that it helps with quitting. For Matthew Perrone of the Associated Press, for the first time, the Food and Drug Administration on Tuesday authorized an electronic cigarette saying that the vaping device from R.J. Reynolds can help smokers cut back on conventional cigarettes. View Solo e-cigarette and its tobacco-flavored nicotine cartridges are now authorized for sale in the United States. The agency said data from the company showed the e-cigarette helped smokers 
significantly reduce their exposure to the harmful chemicals in traditional cigarettes. The product was launched in 2013, and you know what? I can personally attest to the fact that it's possibly the worst vape device ever made. Flavor is almost non-existent. Vapor production is almost non-existent. But it does provide the user with a staggering amount of nicotine to help them quit smoking. Now, if a real direct lung vape were authorized by the FDA, you know, I'd be jumping for joy. But that's not what the FDA is going to do. What did the FDA go do? The FDA finalized two rules for PMTAs. Over a year after the applications were supposed to be submitted, published in Vaping Post, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has issued two new rules reflecting slight revisions, but no substantial changes to the PMTA application process. These rules aim to ensure that all future submissions contain the basic information needed to determine whether these new products meet the relevant pre-market requirements effectively and efficiently. These rules are important components of the FDA's comprehensive approach to tobacco product regulation, which includes pre-market application review, science-based use of the product standard authority, and prioritized compliance and enforcement actions. To the acting FDA Commissioner, Janet Woodcock. Hmm. More like these rules ensure that only big tobacco can submit a complete PMTA. Don't believe me? Let's jump back to the last article, where Kenneth Warner states... The demands the FDA places on companies filing these applications are so extraordinarily difficult to meet that only those with the huge resources and personnel in terms of scientists, lawyers, and researchers are able to file successfully. He even said smaller companies and vape shops should have a separate path to get their products authorized. Is the FDA going to do that? Leave a comment and let me know what you think. Moving on to the land down under and scoop health independent news from New Zealand. Use 19 vaping survey dated disingenuous and damaging. Nancy Lucas, co-director of the Aotearoa Vapors Community Advocacy writes, recent commentary about this 2019 survey does its best to convey the impression that vaping is rife in New Zealand secondary schools. However, Otago University researchers conveniently fail to acknowledge that vaping legislation and regulations have already seriously crunched youth access and youth appeal. Isn't it convenient how these new vape taxes and laws get implemented? But then right after that, researchers publish these outdated information which doesn't take into consideration all the new laws and taxes and prohibitions that they're passing everywhere. Why don't they factor in these recent changes? Because it completely disintegrates their message. University of Auckland researchers last year examined a survey of over 27,000 secondary school students. Researchers found only 0.8% of 14 and 15 year olds who had never smoked were regular vapors. Subsequently, they confirmed that there was no youth vaping epidemic in New Zealand. Now factor in new legislation, which limits flavored vaping products to only specialty vape shops, which are required by law to age verify every single purchase. Do you think those numbers are valid anymore? Of course not. They've completely eliminated the potential source of products for adolescents and severely handicapped adults' access to the same products. So if hardly anyone can legally purchase these products, there's absolutely no way that those numbers can be valid anymore. Fact is, folks, the industry has been crippled with burdensome, disproportionate taxation, slaughtered by access limitations, and downright torched by do good organizations who know that their actions only push more people to light up and burn deadly combustible tobacco. But there still is light at the end of the tunnel. Phelan issues press statement on FDA's first vaping product authorization. On October 12, 2021, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has granted marketing orders for Views Solo, closed electronic nicotine delivery systems, 
and accompanying tobacco-flavored e-liquid pods of R.J. Reynolds Vapor, allowing the products to be legally sold in the United States. It is the first set of ENDS products authorized by the FDA through the PMTA process, marking a milestone for the global vaping regulations. It sends a positive message to the global atomization industry, for it is the first time that a vaping product is authorized by a health regulator indicating that FDA is embracing vaping's potential to improve public health. The scientific data submitted by R.J. Reynolds Vapor has demonstrated that the health benefits of used tobacco-flavored ends, according to the FDA, under the PMTA pathway, manufacturers must demonstrate to the health agency that marketing of new tobacco products would be appropriate for the protection of public health. Meanwhile, Views Alto, Another flagship product of R.J. Reynolds Vapor is awaiting further review from FDA. In September 2020, the company has completed the PMTA submissions of Views Alto, which is powered by film ceramic coil. The authorization of Views Solo by FDA is a sign of more authorization of ENDS products to come. And bet you didn't know the film, together with Vaporesso and C-Cell, is a sub-brand of Shinzen S'more Technology Limited. Well, you know what? If they're being optimistic, so am I. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending October 25th, 2021. I truly appreciate every single one of you for subscribing and watching this weekly report. Don't forget to hit the like button or the dislike button. Let me know what you think. There were many other stories I could have covered from the past month, but time is a precious commodity we never have enough of. I still got to go and winterize and close up camp for the season before I get to finish the Lost Vape the Lima Quest review for you guys. So until next week, be good to each other and keep on vaping.